If you're here, it's because you want to think seriously about your own formation as a kingdom leader. I'm Kevin Minoy, and I invite you to participate in the diverse community of Christian leaders, both anchored and reaching in the work of God. Hang on while we push deep into the crevices of leadership formation, whether as a pastor, educator, organizational leader, or business person. Let's go. Thanks again for taking some time to join me in this four-part series on identity. And this is the last of those four. And I hope that you've had some wonderful times of reflection, examining your own life as it relates to your personal identity, your ministry identity, identity in crisis. And now as we talk about identity in mission, I'm hopeful that this will open up a panorama of thinking that will motivate you in doing the work of God through you in the lives of those that you come in contact with. Identity is vitally important in terms of our conversations about walking with Jesus, and it's equally important in talking about the foundation from which we proceed in fulfilling the mission of God in the world. So I want to talk with you a little bit about that, because often we talk about salvation being the ultimate goal. And, and yes, that is when we talk about other people. We, want to, we, we ourselves want to walk in the way of salvation, but we also want to bring others on the way of salvation. And I want to talk with you a little bit about what that goal is, how our identity motivates us a bit more in that mission. I've come to appreciate the opportunity on occasion to bake persimmon bread because we have a persimmon tree in our backyard and I hate to see the persimmons go to waste. So I figured out how to do this, not because I'm such a great chef or a good baker or anything like that, but because I can read a recipe and I can follow directions and I can listen to those who can do it, particularly my wife. And so uh, through the recipe, through the advice of my wife, I figured out and I've learned how to make persimmon bread. And I know that persimmon bread has a variety of different ingredients that, that comprise it. And usually with persimmon bread, the best advice um, my wife has given me is that I need to get all of the ingredients on the counter all pre-measured because at, some, at one point they all go in together and then you pop them in the oven. Then it, it creates this wonderful aroma and this beautiful loaf of bread that is warm. And, and that's the vision that I lunge for, right? Um, I, I can't wait to have that, that warm persimmon bread coming out of the oven and I'm going to slice it up and I'll probably eat half a loaf just at the first sitting because I like it so much. But in order to get there, there are various ingredients that I have to put together. I put the nuts, the walnuts, I put the raisins, I put the, the sugar or the sweetener, I put the flour, which might be regular flour, it might be almond flour. See, there's variety of different ingredients that we may choose to put in our persimmon bread, but we don't fixate on the individual ingredient. Even though you may use one kind of ingredient, I may use a different kind of ingredient, I put those ingredients together on the counter and then I put them together and pop it in the oven. Now, my focus is not on the individual ingredients. Those are really important, but my focus is, is on that loaf of bread that's gonna come out of the oven in a few minutes and it's going to be wonderful to consume. It's gonna be the wonderful vision and the wonderful flavor and the wonderful aroma that I desire. You see, it's not the ingredients that I'm striving for. It's the final, completed, whole, warm, tasty loaf of bread. That's what I'm lunging for. That's the race that I'm on. That's what I'm pursuing is the wholeness of that loaf of bread, not the individual ingredient. Now, the idea of salvation is a lot like that. You see, salvation has a variety of components that are part of it. And the journey of salvation, and that's a phrase that might frighten you, please don't be afraid. Uh, the journey of salvation is a journey that has various component parts. And yet they all come together for the whole, which is the restoration of the image of God in people. See, that's the best definition I could give you of salvation. It is restoring the image of God in you, restoring the image of God in other people. That's our mission. 
is not only to be to experience that wholeness, what Phoebe Palmer calls full salvation, not just to experience that fullness for ourselves or to experience the journey of becoming whole, but also to invite others onto this journey of becoming whole, of of becoming complete, of becoming healed, of being restored in the image of God. See, that's our mission, experiencing it, walking the journey ourselves, and bringing others on the journey with us. Now, when I say that that salvation is a journey, let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, most of us, we, we, we say, well, what is salvation? It's the moment when we get saved at the front of the church, we say the sinner's prayer, and we're written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Well, salvation is considerably more than that. There is the moment that we put our faith in Jesus Christ, and we are justified by faith in Christ, but that's not the full definition of salvation. Salvation begins when we begin to confess. Our conscience says, what you're doing is not right. We feel a pang of guilt, and we begin to say, that's wrong. I need to change that, and then we change our behavior, and we move in a different direction, and we start pursuing what is good, and then after a while, we get to the point where we realize we can no longer walk this journey of salvation unless we name the name of Jesus. You see, and we come to that point of the cross where Jesus looks at us and he says, I know what other people say about me, but what do you say about me? Who do you say that I am? You see, and in that moment, we are justified, which then allows continual growth in grace on the journey. So we talk about confession. We talk about repentance. We talk about that justifying moment where we place our faith in Jesus for our salvation. And then we talk about the regenerative life that begins to occur within us. And we talk about the adoption into the family of God and the process of learning the family values. And then we talk about that sanctifying grace that begins to transform our nature to become like Jesus, that we may be holy as he is holy. You see, all along the way, the whole objective of salvation is proximity with God. John 14, 6, Jesus is the singular way, the truth and the life. No one comes into proximity with God. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. So you see, the end game here, the end game is proximity with God. The end game is being back in a reconciled condition with God. Reconciliation just means that we are bringing back together two things that once were united but have now become separated. And now we're trying to bring it back into proximity. We are reconciling. We are bringing back into close proximity what once was together but became separated. That's the journey of salvation, bringing back into proximity with God we who were created in close proximity with God but have become estranged. That's why John 14, 14, 6 is so important. You see, and don't misunderstand this, but Jesus is not the end game. Jesus is the means to the end. Jesus is the way to the Father. The end game is being in close proximity with God so that we are transformed into his likeness. And we do that singularly through the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's why he came. Let me explain that a little bit because it's a concept and and maybe we'll do another series on the idea of salvation. But in short, salvation is simply that journey of coming closer and closer to God so that we are remade, transformed in God's image. See, when God created us, he created us in close proximity with himself. You remember, God created us in God's own image. So he looked in the mirror and he saw his image. Very, very good. We are the mirror. And the Bible says that we walked in the cool of the evening with our Lord. That meant that we were tight. We were close. We were in close proximity with God. But he also gave us free will. And when we exercised that free will and we said, we're not going to do it your way. We're going to do it our way. That's selfishness at work now. The essence of sin, incidentally, is not disobedience. It's selfishness. Selfishness is, is the core of sin because Adam and Eve acted selfishly when they said, We don't care what you say, God, about that apple. We're going to go ahead and eat it. In other words, not your will, but my will be done. 
That's what they said. Now, you recognize that prayer, except in reverse from the New Testament, where the second Adam came and said, not my will, but your will be done. The first Adam said, not your will, but my will be done. See, selfishness said, we're going to do it our way. Well, the minute that happened, suddenly that proximity was broken. We were no longer reconciled to God. We were no longer in close proximity. We became estranged. We were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And when you take the mirror away from the original, suddenly it can't reflect the original anymore. It becomes warped. It becomes broken. It becomes uh, unrecognizable. And yet God still loved us that he wanted to figure a way to restore us back into close proximity, to reconcile us. That's why Jesus has the ministry of reconciliation. And incidentally, you too have been given the ministry of reconciliation, bringing people back into close proximity with God. So Jesus came as God's way of reconciling us back into close proximity. The law, the prophets, the priests, they didn't, it it wasn't effective. But in these last days, Hebrews said, he sent his son, Jesus. And it is through Jesus that we come to the Father. See, Jesus is the way by which we come back into close proximity. And as we come closer and closer to God, suddenly the image of God begins to be restored. And the the nature of God's holiness begins to become more and more visible. So we start out here with these pangs of guilt, and then we confess, and then we repent and we turn, and then we come to the point where we say, yes, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus, and then we continue with the new life, the regeneration of life, and then we are adopted and we are learning the family values in this journey of sanctifying grace to become like Jesus, so that we will be holy as he is holy. You see, this is a journey. This is a progression. Not only are you on that journey at some point along that continuum between close proximity with God and estrangement with God, but everyone is somewhere on that continuum. And our responsibility, our mission is to both first be on that continuum and be in proximity with God that we may reflect God's holiness, but also to invite others on that same journey, to invite them closer and closer to God so that at some point they make a decision to say, yes, I put my faith in Jesus and they are in that justifying act, so they may continue the journey of becoming whole. That's a journey of full salvation. That's a journey of imagining the full loaf of bread that's warm and tasty. That's the fullness. It's not fixating on an individual ingredient and debating over whether my walnuts are better than yours, whether erythritol or Splenda or cane sugar is better, or arguing over whether it's almond flour or wheat uh, flour. You see, We can fixate on the individual parts to such a degree that we create division, but God's interested in the whole loaf of bread. He's interested in us capturing a vision of the wholeness for which he's intended us. He's interested in people lunging forward to that fullness of salvation that he has in mind for you and for everyone in your sphere of influence. If I could draw an analogy for you, and on a paper perhaps you might do this, On the left side of your paper, if you could draw a circle, and you probably don't have enough ink to fill it in, but if you could color it solid blue, a solid blue ball, and let's call that blue God. God is blue, blue is God. And then draw a line straight out uh, from one side of that blue ball. And along that continuum, draw little circles, three or four little circles. And those circles represent individual people. And each of those people is at different distances from blueness. And in the one that's closest, you put quite a bit of blue. The one that's next out, you put less blue. And the one way out over here, there's just a few blue dots, maybe one blue dot, you see. That's a a depiction of this journey of salvation. Everyone is created with the image of God. Even the person that's the farthest from God, the most heinous sinner you can imagine, still has the image of God in them. But they have become so estranged that their mirror cannot reflect the image well. And the vestiges of God's image are hidden under layer after layer of lust and greed and personal agenda and selfishness so that it's hardly recognizable. But it's still there. 
See, and our journey as disciples is when we confessed and we repented and we moved and we said yes to Jesus and we embraced the new life and we are learning the kingdom principles through discipleship and learning the family values of living in the kingdom of God. And we are in the journey of sanctifying grace to make us like Jesus. You see, that's our identity as children of God on the journey of full salvation, wherein we are lunging toward the full loaf of bread. And our mission comes out of the confidence of being on that journey such that we now look and we reach those people who are way out here at the periphery. And instead of discarding that person who's doing such heinous crimes, instead of discarding that person who thinks so differently than us, we look under the layers of selfishness and greed and lust and and, 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 and all of the behaviors and we see in them the blue dot that is a remnant of the image of God. And we try to nurture that blue dot so that they come closer and closer and closer. And maybe they've never named the name of Jesus, but they're coming closer and their conscience is bothering them. And they begin to understand, I need to do things differently. So they confess, they say, this is wrong. I'm gonna do it different. There's repentance. And then they finally come to the point where they say, yeah, I need Jesus. And they say, Jesus, I put my faith in you for my salvation. And they are in that justifying moment, see, then they move through that stage and then they begin to feel the new life and they begin to learn the kingdom values of being adopted into the family of God. And they begin to experience the sanctifying grace of being remade in God's own image. See, they're coming into closer and closer proximity. And as they come closer to God, blue starts to show up more and more because the closer you are to blue, the more blue you will reflect. The mirror comes closer to the image and begins to see the restoration of the image of God in that person. And you see, your role in that is securing your identity as a person on the journey of salvation yourself. And out of the confidence of that identity as a child of God, a servant of God, someone who's who's fulfilling ministry as, as the arms and hands and feet of, of God, you are nurturing others along in closer and closer proximity to God. That's your mission, you see, is finding those blue dots. I like to say, we get to go blue dot hunting. And when we find it, we nurture it. We woo it back into closer proximity. That's your identity. And the confidence of your identity on that journey gives you confidence in the mission of reaching others. Let me encourage you that who you are is more important than what you do. The lure of defining yourself by your performance is stronger than you might think. So join me in upcoming weeks as we explore the whole leader God created you to be.